All right, let's get started. Turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 5. Now, I sped hurriedly through Revelation chapter 4, but what you really need to understand is that 4 and 5 go together. Uh, it's one visionary scene as, as, uh, as John is brought into in the Spirit. Now, I don't think he was there physically. I think he's there in the Spirit, um, but he is in the throne room of heaven. And he sees one sitting on the throne that he doesn't really describe. He does, but he doesn't. He tells us that he's bright and that he looks like jewels and that there's a rainbow around him that looks like an emerald. So a rainbow that is more green than anything, I guess. But what we don't see or what we don't have are the description of God himself. And that's intentional. Um, No man has seen God at any time, the Bible says. And, and so we have this separation, even in, in the Revelation, from the, uh, a physical description of the Lord God. What we do have, though, are, uh, are a multitude, 24 elders, four creatures around the throne worshiping him as creator. Uh, it, it, you know, the uh, verse 11 of chapter 4, Worthy are you, our Lord and our God, to receive glory and honor and power, for you created all things, and because of your will they existed and were created. And so we, they, you can see that they're worshiping him as the creator. Notice that going to chapter 5, this is where we are today, just so you can get an overview of what, what we're going to be talking about. We're probably not going to get to the seventh seal today. Um, I'm going to try to get through the great multitude, and, uh, and we'll, we'll try that. The, um, and so in the same setting, the throne room, 24 elders, four creatures around this throne of the one who created all things, representing all things, And in verse number one of chapter five, it says, I saw on the right hand of him who sat on the throne a book written inside and on the back, sealed up with seven seals. And so probably not a book, but a scroll. And probably on that scroll where the where the last piece of the flap of the scroll touches the top of the of the the cylinder. Right there, it has seven seals down that side, like wax seals that would, that would be marked. In the old days, uh, a, a, a dignitary would put a piece of, of wax and then take his ring, that signet ring, and press it in. And so it's kind of like when you seal up an envelope and you sign over the envelope so you can tell if it's been broken or not. That's what that signatory seal was. But now there are seven up the spine of this scroll. And so the one who's sitting on the throne has this extended. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to break its seals? And no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was able to open the book or to look into it. Then I began to weep greatly because no one was found worthy to open the book or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book and its seven seals. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him who sat on the throne When he had taken the book, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song saying, worthy are you to take the book and to break its seals for you were slain and purchased for God with your blood, men from every tribe and tongue and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth. Then I looked and I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders, and the number of them was myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. 
And every created thing which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and on the sea and all things in them, I heard saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and dominion forever and ever. And the four living creatures kept saying, amen, and the elders fell down and worshiped. That, yeah, that may be, I know I say this a lot, that may be my favorite chapter in all the Bible. I love that. I just, it, it, um, it is an incredible picture of all of creation responding to the Lord Jesus. And obviously, y'all know who that is, right? Y'all know that the Lamb is Jesus. Uh, I gave that away. I didn't tell you yet, but um, it, <laughs> I have something else to tell you if you didn't know that. Uh, I, I, we can sit down, and I'll talk to you a little bit about the gospel. But uh, So anyway, let's look at this together. I want to walk through this, and then we'll get to the, the scroll itself. Um, so the king, th th this is the creator king, seated on his throne and held a book, scroll, sealed with seven seals. Now, obviously, that creator king is the father, is God. But uh, it doesn't say that in the text, so that's why I call him the creator king. He is worshipped as being a creator, which we know is God, and he is the king. He is reigning sovereignly over everything, and we know that's God. So we are talking about God the Father, but in this, we just have the image of the one who is seated on the throne. So what is this book? What is this scroll that's being held out? Well, there, it says that it's written completely on one side and on the other. So nothing can be added to it. Nothing can be added to it. There's no room for it to be added. So it is complete, whatever it is. And not only is it complete, but it is obviously sealed up. And it is of such worth that nobody, including, now listen, including all the angels who hadn't sinned ever, and all the redeemed who are considered not having been sinned in Christ's blood, nobody is worthy to open it. Now, you can imagine the reason, I think, and this is, this is what I think, I don't know this, I think that the reason why John cries because there's nobody to open it is not that there's nobody worthy. I think he cries because he, it's with anticipation. He wanted to know what was in it. Remember, this is the vision that God's giving him called revelation, unveiling. And so I think that he wants to know what's in it, and yet it, uh, it's not... Um, it's not in it. There are some who said that it's the, it represents the Lamb's book of life uh, and that he's worthy to take it because of that. There are some who say that it's the title deed to all of creation. Uh, that would seem somewhat okay because the creator king is handing it to the one who redeemed creation. And so it, that's why they say that. Um, I actually believe what we know is in the, in the book um, is the, the seven trumpets and the seven bowls. So I believe that it's really a book about justice. That's, that's what I think. I think it's a book about justice that God is finally going to put to right all of the sin that's taken place from the foundation of the world, from the great creation of the world. And so I think it's a book of judgment. That's my, that's my thought um, only because once the, th once the last seal is broken, we have the trumpets and the bowls, which are clearly God's wrath being poured out. Um, I think that that's why we see that the wrath comes, we'll talk about this later, but the wrath comes on the dragon at the end, all of those things. So I think this book is one of, of judgment, but there's, there's nobody except for one who can open it, right? There's only one worthy. It, if I could be so crass um, or, or so earthy, um, it's almost like um, Thor's hammer in the Avengers movie, right? He, only he could swing it, uh, and then at the end, Captain America picks it up, right? Because I'm a Captain America fan, so, uh, you know, so he picks it up. And so he is, you know, and, and even in one of the movies at the very end, he reaches over for it, and it, and it trembles, giving you kind of foreshadowing that he's going to be able to do it. Well, they're looking for that worthy one who can take the scroll and open it, and there's nobody else there. Notice what he hears. What does John hear when he's crying because there's no other, um, no other one? What does he hear? Okay, all the creatures, and then a command from one of the elders. Stop weeping. There's more to it. 
Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has overcome, says to open the book and its seven seals. So, what does he hear? An answer to his question. Who, is he, who should he expect to see when he hears that? What would you, if all you read was that verse, what would you expect to see? A lion. Very good. The lion of the tribe of Judah. A lion. A lion. Right? Now, obviously, that lion would represent Jesus because Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Uh, I'm trying to put you in the moment. See, one of the things that we do in reading the book of Revelation is we automatically we automatically start translating before we get the whole picture. We, we immediately, you've been told before that this stands for this and this stands for this, and you don't even read what the words are anymore. You're automatically inserting those, those things, and then you come to a place where you're like, I don't get it. That's because if you take what everybody says about things and jumble it together, you're going to miss. You're going to miss out, all right? So, so what you have to do is we still have to go back to the text and read. So if you're John, you're weeping that nobody is able to open the scroll, and somebody says to you, before you see, somebody says to you, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of Jesse, is coming to do that. By the way, I believe the lion of the tribe of Judah is the, uh, is the promised um, Messiah, but conqueror, over, uh, conqueror over all, um, the root of Jesse can be one of two things. Either it's our root which springs from Jesse, or it's Jesse's root. Because remember, it says in Psalm 110 that David said to, David said to my Lord, my Lord. Right? And so David recognized that one who came from him was actually before him. And so this, this is a combination of, I believe, the conquering Messiah and the lion from the tribe of David. Because remember, I mean, the, the lion from the tribe of Judah, because Judah was told all the way back in Genesis that uh, the scepter would never leave his family, his lineage. And so now we have this picture of the lion, the lion, not just, because it said, remember it says in Genesis that Judah was the lion's whelp. Judah is the lion's whelp. Now we see the lion himself is here. So not a whelp anymore. This is the lion. And so he's there from, he's there from the tribe of Judah. And the root of David, I believe, is this, is not, it could be messianic too, in the sense that it comes from the from David's lineage. But I think it's I, I take it to be the root of David. He's the one who came before David. I think this is the eternity of of Christ. Y'all hold on, I'm gonna shut that door. I don't know who's being loud, but I can't take it. Yeah, I quit. When I say I can't take it, I, you got to understand. I process about six things at once. And sometimes they get crossed up. And, um, and so I was listening to that conversation and trying to complete my thought, and it just doesn't work that way. I, Myra will tell you that, in fact, the other day, she, said, she was talking to me. We were at, we were at lunch, and she said, uh, oh, my, my head just hurts. And she was complaining about her sinuses. She goes, my head just hurts. Well, I was trying to figure out, I can't remember, I, I had my phone that I was looking at, or I was looking at the menu to try to figure out. And then like 30 seconds went by and she goes, you didn't even hear what I said. And I said, uh, I did. I said, you said your head hurts. She said, but you didn't see where I showed you. <laughs> and so I said, okay, where does your head hurt? And she went, right here. <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> so I just want you to know your pastor is really human and your pastor and his wife really have the same conversations that you do, um, <laughs> sometimes at the same volume you have them. So it's really okay. We're all, we're all sinners saved by grace trying to, trying to honor Jesus and love one another better each day. So, um, so we, have, we have this one. He's the lion from the tribe of Judah, the root of David, and he's the one who has overcome. 
has overcome. That word, if, if you have one word that represents the whole book of Revelation, it's that word. He has overcome. We are to overcome. The churches have been called to overcome. That's the theme of the whole book, that as we hear the revelation of what God is doing behind the scenes, it is to encourage his people to overcome, to not compromise, to not quit, but to persevere, to overcome, just like Jesus has overcome. So that's what we have. That's the one who is worthy to open the book. Remember, that's a voice. That's a voice that he hears. He says, one of the elders said to me, stop weeping. Behold, the lion that is from the tribe of Judah, that is from the, uh, the, the root of David, has overcome so as to open the book in its seven seals. So he hears a lion. What does he see? A lamb. And I saw between the throne with the four living creatures and the elders a lamb standing as if slain. So I just want you to understand what that means. That means a lamb is standing, and I'm sure it's on all fours, this picture that he has of this lamb on all fours, because who's ever seen a lamb stand on two feet? And its throat has probably been cut across its, across its throat. As if slain, because that's how they killed lambs. They took a knife. In fact, in the old days, whether it was a, from the goats or from the, from the sheep, they took a lamb and they, put, they, they confessed over the head of that animal the sins of the people. And then, actually, they did, for the Day of Atonement, they had two of these. Uh, the priest would confess the sins on one, and uh, somebody would lead that that uh, lamb out, and eventually they started throwing it off a cliff, but in, in, uh, in the early days, they just let it out in the wilderness and let it go, and the guy who took it couldn't come back until after night, right? So the guy who let it out couldn't come back until after nightfall, which was the next day in their calendar. The other one, though, they would confess the, the sins of the people over, over the lamb, and then they would take a, a butcher knife, and they would slit it right across the throat so it would bleed out, they may even, after that, grab it by the legs and hold it up so that the blood would all come out, just like we do cattle or whatever, chickens, you know, whatever. And so, so what he sees is this lamb with his throat cut, having seven horns, that is, not, not trumpet horns or car horns, but horns like a... Like a ram or like that, you know, so seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. All right. So that's what, that's what he sees when he looks at him, the lamb himself. He's be, notice where he is. He's between the throne with the elders and the creatures. So if you imagine, this is what it looks like. By the way, I don't think he was there a moment before. This is a vision, right? This is a vision. And so I think I mean, obviously, he just described the throne. If he was already there, he would have seen him there. So it's a vision, and so I think he just appears there. And, but notice where he is. He's between, if I, can, if I read it correctly, he's between the creator king on his throne and the 24 elders and the, and, and the four creatures. Now, it could mean that he's just in the midst of all of them, which carries with it kind of the same idea, but the, what, it, what it really means is that all of those elders are there because the lamb is there. They wouldn't be able to be there if the lamb wasn't there. That's the picture of this. This lamb is the reason that they're able to come into the presence of God. Let me prove a point to you. I just told you about the way that they crucified the lamb on the Day of Atonement. They would take that blood then, caught in a basin of some sort, and they would carry it in to where? The Holy of Holies. They were already in the temple when all this took place. Now they're going into the most holy place. The place where? Say it loud. Where God lives. And the only way they could get to the place where God dwells or where God lives is with blood. If you remember the Ark of the Covenant, which is what Jill said, 
uh, the Ark of the Covenant is right there. That was, that's both been called in the Old Testament the throne of God and the footstool of God, which, is the, which means that that represented a special presence of the Lord right there. And on top of the, of the Ark was the mercy seat. Right in between the mercy seat were two angels with outstretched wings, probably like this, where they touched one another on each side, but they're looking down on the mercy seat as if they're looking down in wrath or judgment. And so they, the priest, at the instruction of God, would carry in that lamb's blood and would coat the top of the, of the mercy seat so that there was blood interposed between the wrath of God pictured by those angels and the sins of the people which is underneath in the covenant. And so now we have 24 elders and we have the four creatures representing creation who are in the presence of the creator king freely because the presence of the lamb. He is in between them. And so that in between, I may be forcing too much in that language, but, but I really think it means in between the throne and the, and, and the elders, because that, that's, that's what he does. He's between us and God's pure and holy wrath, always. By the way, even in heaven, he's going to be between us and God. Not between like keeping us from the Father, but in the fact that we're there because of him. So, um, by the way, it's here as if slain that people believe, I, I'm one of them, who believe that we're going to be able to still see the scars of the Lord Jesus in heaven, uh, on his hands, on his, on his brow. I don't think he takes his shirt off in heaven, but if he does, we'll see it in his side too. The, we'll see the, um, the marks of his sacrifice on our behalf. That's not what John is seeing right now. John's seeing a lamb as if slain with seven horns. What do you think the horns represent? What do horns represent? So I heard it. Pow power. Power. Not just power, but all that goes with power. So kind of the full gamut of power, authority, virility, all those things in, in history now, that's what a horn has represented. And so Jesus has seven of them. What do you think it means for him to have seven of these horns? All power, all, all of that, complete. The same with the eyes. I'm, I won't belabor that. The, the complete spirit of God. Um, by the way, it speaks of omnipotence, the horns, and omniscience, the knowledge, the all-knowing, because these eyes are all over the earth, right? So he knows all. Everybody good with that? All right. And then... Uh, and then after that scene, notice that, uh, so here's what I want you to do. I, I, I'm going to do this later, and I really want you to see it. He is told something. The lion's going to open the book, but what he sees is not a lion, is a lamb. Now, this is important, and I'll show it to you maybe if we get there by the end of the, end of the morning. Just remember <clears throat> that multiple things are happening in these visions. Yes, ma'am. Hang on with me. We're going to spend a lot of time on the seven seals. Uh, so, so ultimately, the seven seals are um, uh, in, in, the, in the work of the scroll. It's just holding it together, and it's holding it together with authority, complete authority, God's timing, and, and somebody had to be worthy to open them. What we're going to see, though, is when he begins to break those seals, things are going to happen. Yeah, and so we'll get there. Um, but that's what, that's what they are. But so remember, this is a vision now. This is not in real time. I, I keep wanting to tell you that because um, it's important to understand that John is being shown a panorama that he can only focus on little bits at a time. He can't, it, it, it's, it's, it may be like a movie that is the director only showing you what you're supposed to see. Or it may be like real life where he can't take it all in at once. Anybody ever been to the Grand Canyon? Anybody ever try to take a picture of the Grand Canyon? 
Doesn't work, does it? It's just because a, a, a camera, unless you have a super special camera, you can't get the majesty and glory of the Grand Canyon with one camera. That's the same thing I think happens in the book of Revelation. All he can do is look and see, and, and he can't do it all at once. So I think that's part of what's going on here. Then we have the worship of the Lamb. Notice that the creatures and the elders fall down before the Lamb. <clears throat> uh, if you weren't here last week, I'll say again, I believe that the, the, the creatures, there's four of them, Sorry, there's four creatures, and I believe they represent all of creation. Four corners, four usually means creation. Um, I, I believe that the four, be, or four creatures represent creation. I believe that the elders represent all of the saved of all time. 12, 12 plus 12, there's 24 of them. I think there's 12. It represents the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles put together. This is representative of all the, uh, of all the folks who are, who are there. Uh, who are who are believers? No, ma'am, I don't. I I was looking for one. You, I know you saw me do that, but I just thought I may have brought one. I'll be all right. So, uh, thank you for asking. The uh, so they prostrate themselves, and I don't think it says the four living creatures and the twenty four elders fell down before the Lamb, each one holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense. Um, it could be that all twenty eight of those beings, the twenty four elders and the four creatures have this, or it may be just that the 24 elders do. I, I tend to think that because what they're offering is the incense of heaven, which are the prayers of the saints. Um, I, let me just say this. I don't have time to I elaborate, but your prayers are worthwhile to God. They are precious to him. And they aren't just temporary. Like you pray today and you think, well, that prayer is over. I'm going to pray again. It seems that in Scripture, our prayers endure because God is enduring, which also leads me to question about whether it really matters about the timing of your prayer, that God can answer a prayer before you pray it because he's God. So if somebody comes up to me and says, should I pray? The answer is yes, because it is absolutely valuable to the Lord. Notice it doesn't say that the answers of the prayers are the incense of the saints. Y'all notice that? It doesn't say the answers to the prayers. It says the prayers, which means even the prayers that we pray that are answered negatively. No, Jim, I'm not going to give that to you. If it's offered in the name of Jesus with the right kind of heart, it's going to be laid out before the throne as incense. It's going to make heaven smell good, even if you ask something that God doesn't answer. So my encouragement to you is to pray. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, they, yeah, absolutely. We have been commanded to pray, and I, I believe, I've always heard it said this way. I'm not sure... Um, I'm not sure I completely agree with this, but I, I agree with the sentiment that goes with it. Um, pray for everything that's necessary. Pray for everything you want God to handle, and the things you want Satan to handle. Don't pray about. <laughs> so I, I, don't, I don't completely agree with that sentiment, but I do agree with the what's behind it. We ought to pray without ceasing. We ought to we ought to pray. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I know lots and lots of mommies and daddies or grandmothers and grandfathers who's, who take great solace in that truth, that the prayers that you pray today, just because you go into glory without seeing them answered doesn't mean that they're not going to be answered. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. All right. And then the great multitude of angels joined them. This, however, this, by the way, is why I don't think that those elders or the creatures are actually angels, because now it says that the angels come and, and worship with them. Um, now, they may be representative angels, and I, I could see that a little bit, but I really think that because of here, I mean, it's not like John or Jesus didn't know how to say the word angel right? I mean, and, and so I think that means that creatures and elders and angels are, are different, at least in the way I read it, because those are different words. I know you said you went to school for so long to know that those are different words. Yeah, but 
And sometimes you need to see that's how simple Bible interpretation is. It's just to look and say, these are different words. Um, so notice that they worship, worthy is the lamb that was slain. They're, they're singing his worth, and they're telling us why he is worthy. Worthy is the lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. So it's because he died in our place that he is, that he is worthy and that he was accepted as that sacrifice. He, he was an effectual sacrifice, so because of that, he's worthy. And they all worship. They said amen and all worship. Any questions about the throne room? All right. Now, I'm going to take what they call a diversion, just for a second. If I can get this thing to click. Oh, hang on. Oh, yeah, Greg, see if you can click it. If it froze up again, is Jeff Boss here? He fixed it last time. I think maybe I'm staying on one slide too long. Will it not click? Hit escape. Hit F5. Thank you. You fixed it. <laughs> All right, there we go. Um, so when is this scroll handed over and opened? That's a great question. I'm glad you asked it. When does this scene happen? Well, futurists, those who believe that um, all of this is opened in the future, not yet happened, believe that this, he'll break the sea, seals after the rapture with results being contained in the seven years. So most futurists believe in a literal seven-year tribulation period. By the way, nowhere in the Bible does it say that. There are some numbers that are put together. Three and a half you'll see a lot, but there's no place that it says seven. The where, where people get this idea of seven, um, seven years of tribulation comes from um, uh, Daniel chapter 9 and the 70 weeks of Daniel. And what they say is that the church age, that's when we're living right now, is a parenthesis. It's, it's bracketed off from the rest, and it's not even there that Daniel wasn't told about the church age, or Daniel didn't envision the church age. And so the last week of years, which would be seven, seven years, is the tribulation period in Daniel's 70 weeks. I don't hold that because I it just takes a, nobody would read the book of Daniel and see that. You, you, you have to do some, a lot of maneuvering to bring that to bear. Uh, and nowhere in the New Testament does it say there's seven years of tribulation. It does say three and a half a few times, but, uh, but not seven. So uh, preterists believe Jesus. So these preterists are the ones who think that all this was fulfilled in, the, in 70 A.D., Right, so these, this is a different, a different school of interpretation. Preterists believe Jesus broke the seals after his ascension into heaven, with the results being contained in and around 70 A.D. By the way, the conquest of of Judah, Jerusalem, in 70 A.D. was three and a half years. Now, I don't advocate for that, but I'm telling you that's why they get that is because of those. And, and does anybody know what happened to the Christians who were in Jerusalem when Jerusalem was killed? No, no, no. Um, in 70 AD, when the Romans came in, when, when the Romans rode into, into Jerusalem and, and killed everybody, turned, what happened to the Christians? What's that? Yes, they ran away. They were not taken captive. They ran away before the final conquest. At the end of the three and a half years, they went to a place called Pella. This is a historically known thing. The, the whole Christian, Jewish Christian group that was in Jerusalem moved to Pella, which is in Jordan. All right, so um, that's why the preterists would, that's why they see this as more than a coincidence. Now, I'm not a preterist, although. If you could prove to me that this was written before 70 AD, I might listen a little closer. Um, but uh, so that's, the, uh, that's what the preterists believe. Idealists and historicists 
believe that Jesus broke the seals after his ascension with the results spanning all the age until his return. Now that's where I am. That's what I believe. I believe that this I believe that these seals have already been broken and that it it's that what we're living in now, so I'm just going to tell you I've never told you this this clearly outright although I've handed out a lot as I've come. I really believe that we are living in the tribulation right now. And that the 7 years is a symbolic 7 years. And it's it's worse for some than others. It's not a total tribulation all over the earth, but to be a Christian in Nazi Germany, you know, to be a, a, a Christ-following Christian in Nazi Germany, or to be a Christian in Iraq or Iran today, or to be in North Korea or other places, you are persecuted just like some of these things that are said in the book of Revelation. So I really hold that we are in some level of the tribulation all the way through. I think that's why John says, in chapter one, I am a fellow, I'm your brother and a fellow partaker of the tribulation. I think they knew they were in the tribulation then. Um, I do, however, still like the futurist, I still hold out that it's going to get universally worse right before the end. So uh, I am not, I am not, not a futurist. I just think that only a futurist doesn't see the whole scope of what the book of Revelation is saying. Uh, that's what I showed you in when, when I said that, uh, you, you know, I, I showed you the four ways to look at, at, at uh, Revelation, futurist, preterist, idealist, and historicist. And then I said there's a fifth way that kind of tries to combine them. That's what I believe. I believe that in, in, at some level, each one of these makes sense. But I believe, that, I, I believe that it's all tribulation, and then at the end, it's going to be really, really bad. That's what, that's what I believe. Everybody good with that? I mean, you don't have to believe that. I'm just asking you if you understand it. All right, you understand why I would get where I got from there. So that's what I believe. I believe that the seven, just like all the other sevens, I believe that, uh, that tribulation, first of all, it doesn't say seven years of tribulation, but if it ever did say seven years, I think it's a, I think it's a figurative number. I think most numbers in the book of Revelation are figurative. They mean something else rather than just that's the, that's the number. And I'll show you what I mean in a second. So when you think this scroll is open determines on really how the rest of the book goes. Um, and so I believe that it actually, that the, the, the scroll has already been open, and I'll show you why in just a second. So let's look at the first six seals. Linda, this is now the breaking of the seals. All right. So then I saw the lamb, I, then I saw when the lamb broke one of the seven seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures saying, as with a loud, uh, with a voice of thunder, come. I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had, a, had a, a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come. And another, a red horse, went out, and to him who sat on it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. When he broke the third seal, I heard the third living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard something like a voice in the center of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not damage the oil and the wine. The fourth seal, death. I'm sorry, that, that's not in there. I, I read the title. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come. I looked, and behold, an ashen horse, and he who sat on it had the name death, and Hades was following with him. Authority was giving, given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. When the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer, until the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who were to be killed, even as they had been, would be completed also. I looked when he broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth made of hair, and the whole moon became like blood, and the stars of the sky fell to the earth as a fig tree casts its unripe figs when shaken by a great wind." 
The sky split apart like a scroll when it was rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. Then the kings of the earth and the great men and the commanders and the rich and the strong and every slave and free man hid themselves in the caves and among the rocks of the mountains. And they said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come and who is able to stand? Remember, what did I say was the word that that carries through Revelation? Overcome. Overcome. What they're asking is who can overcome? Overcome. That's, that's that last. Who, who's able to stand? Who can overcome? All right. So let me go through this very quickly. First, notice who it is that is announcing the arrival. So we have the Lamb opening the seals. If you can imagine, you know how you do a, an envelope? You, you kind of stick your, if you're like me and don't have a, one of those neat cutters, you stick your finger under one flap of it and then you run it down. Hopefully you don't get a paper cut when you do it, and it rips, the, it rips open the gummy, the gummy stuff that had sealed it down. Picture the same kind of thing. Now, somebody in a dignitary would probably have a pen knife in those days to break those seals. These seals are regular, regular stuff for there, but um, we don't know if he used a knife for his hand, whatever, maybe a horn, <laughs> who knows. But what we see is that he is now opening the seals, and when one pops, a voice says come. Your translation may say come and see. Um, It's either come and see or come and then John saying I beheld or I saw. I believe it's that because I think that the calling from the four four creatures, that calling to come is not to John. I don't think it's calling to John to come. I think they're calling out the horsemen and they're saying come. Come. And that horseman rides out. Now, what does it say about the very first horseman? White horse. He had a bow and a crown. And he went out to conquer. There are lots and lots of Christians who believe that this is representative of Jesus and the conquest of the gospel. So those who would see that this was opened upon his ascension would see that this man on the white horse wearing a crown going out to conquer is the on a white horse on a white horse is the spread of the gospel the alternative to that is that this one on the white horse just represents the conqueror any conqueror bad conqueror good conqueror just the fact that the that the earth will be under that it'll undergo constantly conquering Now, all all you have to do is look back to when Jesus ascended and asked, have nations conquered nations since then? (laughs) In fact, if if you learned history the old way, and that's like before they started getting into all the touchy-feely stuff, all you really learned was battle after battle after battle after battle after nation after nation after nation after nation, ruler after ruler after ruler after ruler, general after general after general after general. And that's the way we learned history. Because history is conquering one after another. Remember the reason for the book of Revelation. Uh, The Lord Jesus is giving it to John to take to a group of churches who were struggling with an empire. An empire who was persecuting them and an empire who was getting ready to um, start putting them to death and making it illegal to follow Christ. And what what, what this is saying is that... that, um, Conquering has always been with us. It's going to be with us until the end. Yeah, no peace on earth until, until Jesus returns. I tend, just to answer the question I threw up, I tend to believe it really means conquering, not the gospel, although the gospel has conquered and has done its work as well. And so if, if you want to say that the kingdom of God is like other kingdoms, and then it'll give way to the end, then I, could, I, I, will, I will grant you that. But I think it's more in mind than just the kingdom of God. I think this is the conquering of all kinds of kingdoms. Um, Jesus said to himself, there'll be wars and rumors of wars uh, all the way to the end. Right? There, in fact, the last war is waged by the Lord Jesus. So uh, it's conquering. So that's why I put conquest there. The second is bloodshed or war. 
When he broke the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come, and another, a red horse, went out. And to him who sat on it was granted to take peace from the earth, and that men would slay one another, and a great sword was given to him. And so we have this... um, By the way, this is why some would say that the white horse is the gospel, because it seems like the red horse is the one that brings death. Um, But uh, either way, I think we make too much of that. I think what we should prepare ourselves for is, like Dolly said, no peace until Jesus returns. No peace until Jesus returns. And and that's just going to be the theme. Uh, I will say this, that there seems to be more peace in our lifetime than in peace before. Uh, we, we have not, I mean, I, I know you say, well, we were in Afghanistan for 20 years. We were in Vietnam for 15. Um, you know, we have all these different things. Um, but the world has not experienced worldwide wars like it used to. Even if the, the thing that made the first and the second world war so atrocious was man's ability to kill efficiently not the fact that there weren't worse wars before. I I use this all the time, but has anybody ever heard of the Hundred Years' War? How long did that last? (laughs) Right, you see? So uh, there there have been other other periods in time where warfare was great. So uh, a lot of people get all bent out of the axle about what's going on in in, the Middle East with Israel, and that may prove to be something or it may not. Israel's been in a lot of wars in their their day. They've won a lot of wars in their day. Uh, It appears like they're winning this war in their day. Um, By the way, I don't think we're going back to Israel next year, just in case you wonder what my plans are. I haven't made specific plans. We were supposed to go this year, and then it got postponed. I don't think we're going next year either. But, um, But all that said, you, you can't, most people can only see from their own perspective. And so you can't judge when Jesus is coming back based on the fact that your political party didn't win the last election. And that seems to be the way we do that. We're like, oh man, we didn't win. You know, Jesus is coming back soon. And then, oh man, we won. We're, we, you know, we're going to usher in the millennium. We're going to skip out, you know, whatever. It was just we, our, our vantage point is, is very limited, very limited. It's, it's, it's dumb to try to predict when Jesus is going to return based on only what we see. It, it really is dumb. So, um, war. And then the third is a black horse. Uh, I called it famine. It's really want or need or, um, emptiness, because it doesn't really say famine, but you, what you hear in the voice that says, a quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not do damage to the oil and the wine, uh, it seems like they're hoarding or keeping back. You know, one of the funniest things that happened this week was on Facebook. It said, regardless of the outcome of the election, don't, don't buy all the toilet paper up. <laughs> you know, try not to do that. So, but this is the idea of of want. And usually a famine brings that. The fourth horseman is death. When the lamb broke the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, come. I looked and behold an ashen horse or a pale horse. And he who sat on it had the name death and Hades was following with him. Authority was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. So we have these fourth horsemen. By the way, probably the the most well-known symbols in all of in all the book of revelation the four horsemen of the apocalypse everybody's heard that you've probably seen a movie um one of my favorite clint eastwood movies is on a pale horse or pale rider that's what it's called pale rider um i love that Uh, i I think because it's he's a preacher and he beats everybody up with a with an axe handle so i I think i like that part of it but (laughs) what's that yeah, that's right. Well, he, it wasn't to his own people. It's for the wickedness of the world. So it, it was okay. Um, but the, uh, the, four, uh, the four horsemen, the fifth seal. And remember, this is all seal by seal. This isn't even the content of the scroll yet. This is break a seal, a horse rides. Break a seal, a horse rides. Break a seal, a horse rides. Break a seal. And then break a seal, and we hear from the witnesses under under the, um, under the throne. 
When the lamb broke the fifth seal, I saw underneath the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and because of the testimony which they had maintained. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on, on those who dwell on the earth? And there was given to each of them a white robe, and they were told that they should rest for a little while longer. I actually believe that that's happening right now. I believe that those in heaven are crying out to the Lord saying, How long? How much longer? I mean, I know we're crying that out, right? How much longer? What they're crying out, though, is not how much longer until we have rest. They're already having rest. What they want is vengeance. When is this going to be made right? When are you going to judge? Now, we do that some too. When is all this going to be made right? But in the patience of God, this is from the earthward or earth, earthly perspective, the patience of God is so that others can repent of their sins and trust Christ. He is still redeeming folks to be a part of his kingdom. For those who are already there, they're saying, how long? How long? When is this going to end? Now, those who are only futurists um, don't necessarily believe that that's happening now. That they, they believe that these martyrs are the ones who died in the tribulation, were killed for their faith in the tribulation, and they're saying, how long? Um, notice what I said earlier about my belief of the tribulation. So I would say that, yes, these are those who have died in the tribulation, but I believe it's happening right now. They would say it's, it's relegated to the end of, of time. Either way, we believe the same thing about who these folks are. One thing that you need to know, though, the word martyr hasn't always meant what you and I mean it to mean. If I'd ask you to define what a martyr is, what would you say? Somebody who dies for a cause or for their faith. They, they, they die. So the word martyr, I, I read it all the time to you through our regular readings, but you don't hear it martyr, you hear the word witness or witnesses. Originally, in Greek, that word does not mean somebody who dies for their faith. That word means witness, witnesses. Um, and, and so it's all, so in Acts, where it says, and you will be my witnesses, it's saying you'll be my martyrs. That, that word is there. When it talks about us being witnesses for the Lord, it talks about being martyrs. It's only in history when, they, when those witnesses began to be killed for their faith that it took on this other connotation that was someone who died for their faith. I just bring all of this up to you because it doesn't necessarily, I don't think it necessarily has to be someone who is slain for their faith, but one who is persecuted for their faith or one who dies while in the faith or while giving to the faith. I believe that all of us are going to be martyrs if we overcome, if we, get, if we are in Christ, we'll be in heaven and we'll be counted as some of these. I know that's different than what you've ever heard, but I just believe that this is talking about, because let me give you the big picture again of Revelation. We're, we're talking about people who are trying to decide whether they're going to compromise in order to work or eat or live whether they're going to give a little of their faith away so that they will make it in society. I think the great danger is that those who compromise their faith to get along in society are actually not overcoming. They're actually giving up. Now, I'm not trying to, I'm not, I don't, I don't know at what, I don't know how much we can give up before we cross that line. But I'm just saying, this is what makes it, that's why as he writes to those churches in, in Asia, and he's saying, repent or I'm going to come, I'm going to judge. You remember, they were, part of their compromise was they were letting people, false teachers to come in. Part of their compromise was they weren't loving like they should have been loving. All of these things are serious um, indictments against those churches. It's not just something we can pat on the back and say, oh, it's okay. These are serious indictments. And so I think in the scope of all of Revelation, those who persevere and don't compromise are the ones who overcome, and they will be found dying as witnesses for Christ because of their, 
They're intentional, not compromise. Does that make sense? So I think this whole picture is that we all are part of this panorama. Now, again, you can push this until the end, this great crescendo that I think is going to happen of, of totality and violence. And I believe that lots and lots of Christians will be killed for their faith. But I want you to understand that just because American Christians aren't being killed for their faith doesn't mean Indian Christians aren't being killed for their faith or Iranian Christians aren't being killed for their faith or North Korean Christians aren't being killed for their faith. You see, lots of our interpretation comes from America point of view where everything is hunky-dory and has been for 400 years. But that's not the state of Christianity in the world. And notice it's not persisting in America much longer. We were given a great breath of fresh air, um, foretaste of heaven maybe, but I believe that we I believe that we shifted our thanksgiving from the Lord Jesus who brought it to us to our political system who brought it to us, and I believe now we're losing it because we're no longer giving the Lord Jesus thanks for what he gave us, not what Benjamin Franklin gave us or whomever. Yeah, we've lost our first love. We have, we have wandered away. Uh, although this losing our first love is akin to idolatry, not just a fading of love. Um, I, I, believe, I believe there are many, not all, and I, I, please do not hear that if you, me say that if you are patriotic, I think you're an idolater. I don't think that. But I think that there have been many Christians who have crossed the line and, and they have become idolaters in, in what, who they think they owe allegiance in first place. So, all right, so they had the impatient martyrs. By the way, that word impatient is not bad. It's just the best adjective I knew to describe them. They're saying how long, that sounds like impatience to me. I'm not, I'm not saying they're sinning or anything like that from their impatience. They're just eagerly waiting for the Lord Jesus to bring out re re retribution. And by the way, it says that we're supposed to eagerly await his return too. And so this should, this should also characterize us. Everybody good with that? You don't have to agree completely. I'm not trying to, please don't understand. I'm just trying to do two things. I'm trying to explain what it could mean, and I'm then telling to tell you what I think it means, but I'm not expecting any of you to say, hey, I got to believe exactly like Jim. I, it's taken me a long, long time, a lot of study to get where I am, and, um, and I'm not expecting you just to take my word for it, but I will encourage you, start reading. Don't just read the authors that agree with you. Read other interpretations from other Christians to see what they're saying and, and see that we may not have the complete picture in, in, what, uh, in what we read. And then finally, the sixth seal is, um, is this earthquake and cosmic destruction. There are two things that I want to show you in this. Um, one is the cosmic destruction itself, the earthquake the sun being made black, the whole moon like blood, and the stars of the sky falling to the earth. Um, there are two ways to interpret this. One is literal. If that is literal, it has not happened yet, obviously. right? If it, if, if it is literally going to do that, then it has not happened yet. The other way to read it, and we have... Um, we have a, uh, a reason to think this may be true. We didn't just make this up. And, and that is that in history, the falling of empires, the falling of, of dynasties has been likened or has been explained with this kind of language. Even in Scripture, if you go to Isaiah chapter 13... It's, there's a prophecy about Babylon. And it says, The oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw. Lift up a standard on the bare hill, raise your voice to them, wave the hand that they may enter the doors of the nobles. I have commanded my consecrated ones, I have even called my mighty warriors, my proudly exulting ones, to execute my anger. 
a sound of tumult on the mountains like that of many people, a sound of the uproar of kingdoms, of nations gathered together. The Lord of hosts is mustering the army for battle. They are coming from a far country, from the farthest horizons, the Lord and his instruments of indignation to destroy the whole land. Wail, for the day of the Lord is near. It will come as destruction from the Almighty. Therefore, all hands will fall limp and every man's heart will melt. They will be terrified. Pains and anguish will take hold of them. They will writhe like a woman in labor. They will look at one another in astonishment, their faces aflame. Behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger, to make the land a desolation, and he will exterminate its sinners from, with, from it. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. Thus I will punish the world for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. Okay, so in, in Isaiah chapters 10, 11, 12, 13, what God is saying is that the servants, remember he said, my warriors are going to come in? My exalting ones? What he's saying is that he is using the nations to judge other nations. Isaiah 10 is about Assyria. He used the Assyrians to judge the northern 10 tribes of Israel. But he says, don't worry, I'm going to judge the Assyrians. And then he says, the Babylonians are going to be the ones that come on and, and judge the last two uh, tribes, Judah and Benjamin. And they're going to, we're going to judge them. But don't worry, I'm going to judge the Babylonians. And then after the Babylonians comes the Medes and the Persians. But don't worry, I'm going to judge the Medes and the Persians. Nobody is, so e what God is saying is, even though I use other, other nations for judgment, they're not getting off the hook for their, their wickedness. So in this, now I know some would say otherwise, in this, I believe that in verse number 10 of Isaiah 43, what he's saying is that there, is a, that there was going to be a day coming when there's a shifting of empires there in the Babylonians. The Babylonians aren't always going to be in charge. Now, it is possible that right there in the middle of that prophecy that God begins to speak about the end of the world. That's how many people translate that. But I don't think that's a necessary, I don't think it's necessary to do that just because he says the day of the Lord. The day of the Lord is always judgment and salvation. And, and the one and only day of the Lord will be at the end of time, but there have been lots of days of the Lord where the Lord has shown up in judgment. And he, and he shows up and he judges. He did that in 70 AD. That's why the preterists think Revelation is about 70 AD. He did it when he judged Jerusalem. Because remember, Jesus promised his people. They walked out. He and his disciples walked out the night before he was, he was uh, betrayed. They, or the night of his betrayal. They walk out and they, hey, look, Jesus, look at the buildings. Look at the temple. And what did Jesus say? It's all going to fall down. It's going to be destroyed. You see, the emptiness... Right, now, I'm not going to get to chapter 7. I wanted to, but I'm not going to get there. Here's, here's what you have to see. When, when Jesus showed up, there were two kinds of people that were there. Those who received him and those who rejected him. At the beginning, most of the people that received him were Jews. At the beginning, most of the people who rejected him were Jews. Most of the people who rejected him were the Jewish leaders of the Jewish religion. Jesus says over and over again in John 14 and 15 and 16 that if you reject me, you have rejected my father. And if you have seen me, you have seen my father. And if you respond to me, you will be kept by my Father. So what I want you to see is that when the religion of Judaism or of Jewishness, if you prefer, when that religion rejected Jesus, he judged it. And the judgment was the temple being destroyed in 70 AD. That's the judgment of God. That's not accidental. That's not the Romans. Remember, 
Because what was the sign that Jesus gave before he said all that about the temple? What did he do? Oh, he changed out on the money changers. It has to do with a tree. The fig tree. The fig tree. He went up to the fig tree and it didn't have any fruit on it. And so he cursed it and it withered. That is a prediction about Judaism that didn't bear fruit, that didn't accept. And so Jesus cursed it. He said, the temple's going to fall and not one brick is going to be on another. And that's what happened. And so I just want you to understand that, that God has been judging throughout history and he's, he's making exalted empires crumble. And when they crumble, it could be described in this cosmic language that the, the sun turns black and the, mount, you know, and the mountains fall and all, all of that stuff. Now, it's still, I, I, I'm not telling you it's not going to literally happen at the end of time. I don't know that. But what I do know is that lots and lots of, of revelation is written in figurative language. This figurative language has been used before to talk about the, the falling of empires. Let me just ask you this. If America were to crumble, I don't mean slowly, but I mean we just imploded on ourselves and broke down, do you think that the world would view it as something significant? Oh, absolutely it will. Think of, how many, think of how many nations right now exist because we are their protection, because their neighbor, or else their neighbor will come in because they're bigger or stronger and take them. Think about our economy. Think about the fact that the whole world runs on the dollar bill and learns English as a second language. Now, think about the collapse of America in a year or all at once, and reckon what that would do to the entire world. They might describe it as the sun turning black and the moon turning red and the stars falling out of the sky. Now, I'm, I'm not saying, please do not hear me say this. If it happens literally, I won't be wrong because <laughs> I really believe that that can happen. God can do that, and it might work that way. But what he's, I think what he's saying to us is that all of this is happening all around us all the time, but we must persevere. I want to get to one more thing. Just introduce this piece to you so we end on something good. Y'all good with that? All right. I'm going to introduce this to you. We will talk about it more in two weeks. They said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us and hide us from the presence of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to stand? After this, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds of the earth, so that no wind would blow on the earth or on the sea or on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the rising of the sun, having the seal of the living God. And he cried out with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was granted to harm the earth and the sea. Do not harm the earth or the sea or the trees until we have sealed the bondservants of our God on their foreheads. Who can stand? Those who have been sealed by God. How have we been sealed by God? Yeah, putting our faith in Jesus been sealed by the blood, sealed by the Spirit. All of these, whoever you decide these 144,000 are in the great multitude, you have to know one thing. They are followers of Jesus. I believe, I'll tell you who I believe they are in two weeks. You have to go read about it later. But what I want you to recognize is the good news. Who can stand when, when all this tumult is going on, when the horsemen are riding, when the wars are coming, when the, uh, when the wrath of God is coming, who can stand in the middle of all that? Those who have been sealed by God. Um, so she said, it doesn't mean we're standing here on earth. It, it really represents. So if those things happen while you're on earth, yes, you'll, you'll remain faithful. I believe that this idea of standing is not living your physical life out, but that your eternal salvation 
this eternal life, this new heavens, new earth, you forever and ever in a resurrected body, that can't be taken away from you. Yeah, that's what, that's what that means. We'll get to that, though. We'll talk about it. I have lots more to say about the 144,000 and the great multitude and all this. But uh, anyway, y'all good? Everybody okay? I haven't shaken any of your... You don't hate me now that I think something different than you do, right? All right, good. I'm glad. Please don't hate me. I love you guys. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Have a good day. <laughs>